Funding provided by the Connecticut Democracy Center, the Governor M. Jody Rell Center for Public Service at the University of Hartford, Travelers, and Yukon Health. Good evening, everyone. I'm Catherine Shen, education reporter at Connecticut Public. Welcome to tonight's second congressional district debate, live from the Fine Arts Instructional Center's concert hall on the campus of Eastern Connecticut State University. Tonight's debate is a collaboration between the League of Women Voters of Connecticut and Connecticut Public. Before I introduce the candidates, let me first go over the cumulative time format. The format is designed to allow the candidates time to discuss the issues. The only rule is that the total time used by each candidate by the conclusion of the debate must be approximately the same. The candidates will not be restricted to one or two minute responses. Instead, they may spend as little or as much time as they feel is appropriate to discuss each issue. Our goal is to encourage debate. The candidates will take turns being the first to respond to a question. Following the question period, each candidate will make a two minute closing statement. Members of the League of Women Voters are serving as timers for the debates and will keep us informed of the time expended. If a serious imbalance in time use occurs during the course of the debate, I will call it to their attention. Applause is permitted at the start and at the end of tonight's program. And now, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage Democratic nominee Joe Courtney. and Republican nominee, Mike France. Thank you both for joining us tonight. And the first question was chosen by a coin flip before the program started, and it goes to Mr. Courtney. What actions do you propose the federal government take to address increasing health care costs for the average citizen? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you to CPTV and Eastern for hosting this uh, this evening. And um, you know, the question of healthcare costs has been uh, a persistent issue from the first day that I took office. Uh, I think um, you know, last August, uh, the House of Representatives voted for an historic piece of legislation, which AARP uh, put out banner headlines talking about um, the prescription drug bill that now will finally uh, use the government's leverage of negotiation to bring down the cost of medications. It will save the taxpayers money because we're overpaying right now in terms of prescription drugs, and it also will save patients. Uh, next year, uh, the cost of insulin for Medicare will be capped at $35 a month. That's about a third of what a, a, a diabetic pays today who is on Medicare. Uh, and then over the next two years, they're going to be implementing an overall cap of out-of-pocket costs. It'll be $2,000 uh, in total uh, by 2025. For patients who have multiple sclerosis, um, this change is life-changing uh, because the cost of infusions, which Medicare pays, the, the co-payments and, and deductibles for MS patients can run thousands and thousands of dollars per infusion. So, um, you know, to me, that is an example of really smart policy in terms of trying to control health care costs. If you look at insurance premiums in the state of Connecticut that were just approved by the State Department of Ed, uh, Insurance, uh, in fact, it was prescription drug costs that was the biggest cost driver that raised premiums for next year. Uh, I would like to see that Medicare bill extended to working age families uh, by, again, uh, providing that the, that the negotiated savings for pre prescription drugs would be applied to employer-based health plans. That was in the bill when it was in the House. Uh, unfortunately, it was stripped uh, in the Senate. It did not uh, attain the 60-vote margin to, to invoke cloture. 
But again, the, 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 the idea and the issue is far from gone. And, the fact, and, and as we see this new prescription drug, drug bill implemented, and we see the, the benefits it has for people 65 and older, um, I think, frankly, the political argument to extend it to, to larger groups of the population will become even more powerful. And we, we will deal with, again, a major component of what healthcare looks like today. Mr. Frantz? Thank you, and also thank you to CPTV and League of Women Voters for sponsoring this debate. I think the challenge that we see is uh, in healthcare, the more that government has gotten involved in healthcare, the more expensive it has become. We certainly can control the programs like Medicare and Medicaid because those are government-sponsored programs, but those that are not uh, on those programs bear the cost of that. There are, I think there are things that we can do to streamline the process of developing drugs and to negotiate. I think the negotiation theme of the federal government being able to negotiate prices directly for those uh, benefic beneficiaries is positive. The challenge is those that are not on a government insurance program do not derive that benefit. The more that we are able to have a free market solution to this and the better that the individual patient can negotiate directly with their doctor for their care, the better the opportunity are. What's the challenge is that when government has gotten involved, they've increased the regulation and the oversight on the individual doctors, and we've seen a decrease in the number of independent care doctors that are providing those services in communities. And they've moved to large groups or they've moved to the hospitals. And I think that's a challenge for the individual who's seeking care that is now in a hospital system as opposed to being able to go see their community doctor. The challenge that I think we need to see is talking to the doctors that are providing the care and finding out from them what are the impediments to providing those services directly to the patient. Listen to them, listen to what the changes have been, and then enact in law what provides a benefit to the patients as they see in the doctor's offices that will really improve the care for patients. So both of you mentioned Medicare, and on a related question, and we'll start with Mr. France this time. Do you support lowering the age for Medicare? Why or why not? I think the challenge with lowering the age for Medicare is you expand the base of people that are eligible for it. The model is based on a certain number of people above age 65. If you increase the number of people that are eligible, you now have to increase the rate or expand the uh, the, the opportunity, if you will. The current model is a portion where you pay into that system through your working life, and then you earn the benefit at 65. If we lower it to 55 or 50 or we expand it to everybody, that model will not work because the cost will not be available within that the tax rate that is there. So you would have to increase the taxes that are taken out of the individual. I don't know that anybody has looked at what that cost would be uh, but I do believe that the challenge will be how do you pay for it uh, as you expand that. So I, I think the better choice is to look at the free market solution of individuals being able to seek medical care directly with their doctors as opposed to through a government-mandated one-size-all-fits solution. Mr. Courtney? Sure. I enthusiastically support lowering the age to age 55. In fact, I've uh, co-sponsored legislation, original co-sponsor legislation to do uh, precisely that. And um, again, this would be, the, the law basically would set up a system where it would be voluntary, it would be optional, uh, people would not be mandated um, to, to take Medicare at, at age 55 to age 65. Um, but you would have, again, the benefit of a lower uh, 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 premium cost, which again has an, in fact been studied and analyzed, is that for, for people in that age group where age rating in the private market is much higher than younger people, uh, uh, having a Medicare option to buy into actually would, would result in savings. Uh, again, it, it would not be uh, paid for exactly like Medicare. Uh, people would either uh, get it through their, their employer or their own uh, tax deductible uh, premium payments. Uh, if you qualify for the Affordable Care Act, uh, the tax subsidies that you presently receive to pay to buy uh, health insurance on the exchange could be applied to a, a Medicare plan. Uh, again, we've run the numbers, and, and this actually is a very workable solution. It actually would introduce into the pool of Medicare patients a healthier population, which actually means there would be less utilization than people who are older. So actually, it would be good 
for the fiscal solvency of the Medicare program. And again, it would be volunteer. No one's going to force anyone or mandate anyone to take it. Um, if they have a, a health plan where they work or, or you know, whatever arrangement they prefer, um, th they're not going to be forced to do it. But that option should be there. So the next question comes from the public. Um, this, we will start with uh, Mr. Courtney this time. What do you view as the federal government's role in helping reduce the cost of higher education? So, um, you know, again, it's great to be here at Eastern Connecticut State University, um, which is, again, one of the really outstanding institutions that has a relatively affordable tuition. Uh, uh, and again, the state of Connecticut is responsible for part of that. Uh, again, federal programs going back to the 1960s and 70s, Stafford Student Loan Program, Pell Grants um, also provide uh, accessibility uh, for, for students who uh, attend this uh, university. The um, you know, issue of student loan debt, which still hovers uh, over the whole economy, um, it was $1.7 trillion before the president's executive order, uh, which, depending on which analysis you use, uh, brought it down to about $1.3 or $1.4 trillion. So it's still a huge overhang in term that really hinders um, really people in a lot of ways in terms of life decisions. Uh, and frankly, if they um, are not in a gainful employment situation, they can find themselves really trapped with, with loans, um, you know, for, for almost their whole lives that are there. Um, again, the, the, the president's measure, which again is cut off at, at a certain um, date in terms of loans that will be eligible for discharge, um, in my opinion, did, you know, clearly left a lot of meat on the bone in terms of dealing with higher education affordability. Uh, I am someone who believes that um, the government should get out of the business of charging interest on Stafford student loans. Again, the, these, these loans now originate at the U.S. Department of Education, so any interest that's collected is a windfall for the government. That was not the intent of Stafford uh, when it was created. And, uh, and, and basically taking interest out of the equation, you would still be responsible to pay back the principal of, of the loan, um, is something that um, other countries in, in different parts of the world have, have uh, structured their student loan uh, programs. The other thing that we need to do, though, frankly, is to go upstream and look at really the quality of um, institutions in terms of whether or not they really are providing degrees that really provide people with gainful employment. That was actually started under the Department of Education uh, when Arne Duncan was Secretary of Education a few years back. And it, it got completely sort of undermined by, um, you know, sort of interest pressure. Uh, but the fact is, is that um, there are too many institutions that uh, I think really saddle people with, with high levels of debt, particularly in the for-profit community, um, that we should not be using public dollars to um, really put people on a pathway that is highly questionable in terms of whether or not they're going to succeed in life. So again, it's, it's, my position is twofold. Number one, we should restructure the way loans are written to get rid of interest. And number two, we really should be tightening up in terms of what institutions can actually um, utilize these programs. Mr. Fran? I think the first thing, first thing we look at when you look at the cost of higher education is that the more federal money that has come into the program, the higher the cost has been. When I went to college in the 80s, the maximum student loan was $10,000. Now it's $37,000. And over that time, the cost of education has gone up. You've had access to greater uh, loan money uh, along the way. And so when you look at that as the uh, entering argument, uh, you also look at the, the challenge of whether you go to college or not uh, is a financial decision, uh, which is not really what the intent was. Uh, when you go back another generation, uh, educa college education was something that was reasonable and very affordable for most. Uh, we also need to look at how do children, uh, young adults, make the decision on whether to go to college or not and what to study I think that starts in high school, and you need to have a conversation with the child as they're going through their education model. And I think the, that then resides with state departments of education, where they in, incentivize guidance counselors to ensure that they're helping the student as they're move, progressing through their secondary education on what they're going to study in college, and then not only what they want to study as an interest, but then what do you want to do with it. When you look at the student loan uh, issue that we have today, it is substantial. Uh, but the challenge is when you look at the model, uh, we have a number of students that don't graduate from college and don't earn their degree, yet they incur the debt. 
And I think that goes back to helping children uh, as they graduate from college, young adults, to make the decision on going to college right away or entering the workforce and going to college later. In my situation, I, didn't, I went to college and, and was not mature enough and went and entered the Navy and three years later went to college after I had saved up money to go and then earned a scholarship. But I think that the challenge we face when we look at higher education is how do we ensure the success of the student as they enter and the success is measured by their graduation. Uh, we look at the number of graduates at the six to seven year point beyond high school, and you're only looking at a f just over 50%. That's not a good model, and then what happens is those that don't earn a degree still have the debt, but now their uh, hiring ability is still based on their high school education, and it's very challenging for them to discharge that debt. I think that's something that we need to look at. Well, I think it's really hard to talk about education now without talking about student debt, which you've both mentioned. So the next question, which we'll start with Mr. Francis, what is your view on the federal government in alleviating student debt? Frankly, I don't believe there is a role. When you take out debt of any kind, it's an investment. Whether you purchase a house, you purchase a car, or you go into education and you, you use a debt to incur or to go to college, you're investing in yourself. And that investment needs to be returned, and you have to pay on that investment. The, that, I think, would make a different decision for young adults graduating from high school. Do I take on the debt, or do I save money, or do I go to a community college first versus a four-year university? I think those are all different questions that we can help them to make their way through. When you look at the substantial debt that we have, the challenge that people have, they've earned degrees that maybe they're not able to find a job in that degree. And therefore, they are challenged with paying back the loan. The federal government has already looked at reducing the amount of payment that is obligated, and I think that is where you go. But we always have to look at, it's an investment in the individual. No different than any other investment, that investment must be paid back. Whether we look at interest rates, I think that is something that is important because if you look at the evolution of federal loans starting in the Higher Education Act of 1965, they've evolved from guaranteed student loans where the federal government guaranteed a portion of the loan to now their direct federal loans. And if we look at the last three years of deferred payments, there's no way that we could have done that if it had still been under the model of a guaranteed student loan. I think there's challenges with having the government be the source of loans and not be in the free market of, with a guaranteed process so that the risk of effectively a signature loan on the student who is going through college is not solely borne by the banks. Mr. Courtney? Sure. I mean, one thing I would definitely agree with, Mike, is that, um, you know, when, when um, young people are making decisions about uh, whether to enter higher education uh, at any different sort of, um, you know, platform, um, that is a life decision now, which can really have profound impacts for decades to come. And I do think that you know um, those decisions now really need a lot more focus and support for students um, to really fully understand the choices that they're making. I, I actually think the high school counselors are some of the most important people, um, you know, in our society right now in terms of really uh, making sure people just don't make bad choices that can sometimes really saddle them, you know, with a lifetime of. Um, albatross of, uh, of debt. Again, I, um, since I've been uh, on the Education and Labor Committee during my time in Congress, uh, you know, one measure that I think has really uh, is a good program is the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, uh, which was enacted in 2007, signed into law by President George Bush. It was a bipartisan bill. And again, the, the intent of that was to basically um, say that uh, people who um, graduate from, from higher education have student loan debt, go into teaching, nursing, um, military service, um, you know, all different forms of uh, public service, nonprofit um, institutions that after uh, 10 years of staying um, current uh, with their debt can apply for, for discharge. Um, again, this was a bipartisan measure when it, when it was enacted. You know, under Betsy DeVos, uh, the Department of Education did everything they could to hinder the execution of the first cohort of students, which uh, commenced in 2017, 10 years after the law was passed. 
Uh, there were lawsuits galore. Uh, they were discharging less than 1% of eligible applications. Uh, one thing I think uh, Secretary Cardona has done extremely well is to basically reset that program and establish a waiver for people who, again, have done their 10 years of public service, but really um, got sort of stuck in this bottleneck at the Department of Education. There's a waiver program, which, and I think for people listening, uh, actually expires on October 31st uh, for people to get the benefit of that reset, and I strongly encourage people to investigate it. It's a very easy tool for them to, to get assistance and help. Again, I talked about how I think interest, which I think is really kind of the cancer for a lot of people with student loan debt, is something that the, the government should just um, get out of that business. So the next question, we will start with Mr. Courtney. What actions do you propose the federal govern, government take to address inflation? So, um, you know, the cost of living is clearly an, a, a, a very important issue that we get lots of calls into our office and we do everything we can to try and uh, provide assistance to people. Um, again, I think if you uh, look at the measure which the president just signed into law, I talked about the prescription drug bill, which is going to, again, reduce costs um, for uh, people on Medicare with really one of the biggest items that they have to pay for, namely prescription drugs. That certainly is going to be uh, a great assistance. Uh, a couple days ago, the uh, Department of Health and Services also announced that next year's premium for Medicare Part B, which again is the, that um, premium that's deducted from people's Social Security check, is actually going down in 2023. Um, it's, this is the first time in 11 years the premium has gone down. Uh, my office actually has been pushing Secretary Becerra to, to recognize that they actually overcharged last year, and to his credit, they actually adjusted the premium. When, when Social Security's COLA comes out uh, later this month, the projection is roughly around 8% COLA for people on Social Security. So there's going to be some relief uh, for people, again, in that uh, fixed income, older age group in terms of a higher Social Security payment, smaller Part P premium, and help with prescription drugs. But there is obviously a much broader uh, population that is really struggling hard. The, in, the bill that the president signed on, in terms of energy production uh, doesn't get talked about a lot, but it, it mandates that the government um, has to open up more leases in the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska for oil and gas drilling because we need to increase supply. It's certainly uh, at best or you know at worst a, a transition source of fuel, and there's there's no question that there's there's hardship out there in terms of. Um, oil and gas prices, even though there's been some moderation uh, recently. But I'm not under any illusion that the problem is solved. And, you know, again, making affordable options for people to retrofit their houses with heat pumps, uh, to get sort of decoupled from fossil fuels, solar, geothermal, um, which, again, there's very generous tax credits uh, that I think is going to help people really be able to, to sort of retrofit their homes to, to lower uh, energy prices. Mr. Franz? The issue with inflation is principally driven by two things. First is the infusion of trillions of dollars of money into the economy with no economic basis for it. The second is the cost of diesel fuel based on the policies of this current administration. When you look at that, over 80 percent of the goods that are distributed across this country either come by tractor trailer or by rail uh, that use diesel. So when you double the cost of diesel fuel, you double the cost to transport the material across the country and deliver it to the people. So when you look at it, those are the policies of this administration uh, that took uh, an inflation rate that was below 2 percent and now taken it up over 8 percent in under two years. And when you actually look at the number, the federal government changed how they calculate inflation a number of decades ago to remove both food and energy costs. And so when you actually compare apples to apples, we are far worse than we were in the 70s from a numbers perspective. And I think that's something that the people understand every day when they're filling up their cars and when they go to the grocery store to buy food. That's the reality that the average uh, person, and unfortunately, my opponent has not said much about this in the policy of the Biden administration that have led directly to day one of shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline, which would have brought oil from Canada here to be refined in the U.S., and when we were energy independent, and now we're not, we're now susceptible to international incidents and the issue of 
whether we can get oil here and the cost of that. I think that is something that we need to be self-sufficient in so that we aren't susceptible to the uh, international actions. I think that those are the first, those are the things that are driving it. I think the key is to get back towards energy independence, to open up the drilling on federal land, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, Congressman Courtney is talking to that. But the challenge is we've created this problem by the policies, and it's interesting that we're going to talk about opening that back up again when the president stopped it to almost two years ago. Those are the things that are truly driving and causing the uh, people to really be making hard choices about how they live their lives. You know, they, recently now here in, in New England, we are issuing the uh, contracts for heating oil, and you're seeing people paying two and three times as much as they did last year because that's a direct reflection on the cost of diesel when you look at heating oil. Those are very real costs that could be two to three thousand dollars a year more for every family. That, that is a substantial increase that they are not prepared for, and that's caused by the policies of this administration. And Mr. Courtney, would you like a chance to I respond? Mean, just briefly, um, you know, oil is a, is a commodity whose price is set on an inter international market. Um, the U.S. is now today the number one producer of oil and gas in the world. That's a fact. Um, and the um, Keystone Pipeline uh, was a pipeline. It did not produce oil. It, it was not a, a drill rig. Um, and uh, oil from Canada uh, is flowing nicely into the U.S. today. Um, they, the um, uh, oil companies and the uh, oil drillers up in, in Canada found alternative uh, means to, to transmit Canadian oil into the U.S. But when I say into the U.S., it's really into the international global market because that's really where the price is set uh, every single day. There's no question there's international factors that is driving up the price all across the world for oil and gas. I'm not saying that we're helpless and we, we, we can't do anything. As I said, the uh, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act included a provision for more drilling and actually also uh, more tax credits to um, promote uh, nuclear power, um, which, uh, again, I support. I think that's um, another way of having sort of, um, uh, you know, power generated uh, by our own, uh, within our own borders um, that can, again, take a, us away from fossil fuels. Uh, the, um, as I said, the, the, this is an issue that we are very mindful of. The, the package that we voted on last week in the, in the House and the Senate uh, uh, increased uh, the heating oil assistance program by a billion dollars. It's probably going to need more, and, and we can do another supplemental as we've done in past years based on weather and price. So um, our office is very focused in terms of getting help to people who are struggling with these issues. And as I said, um, we have the good news is particularly for Social Security, which covers really well over probably about 150,000 constituents in a total district of 700,000. They are going to get some relief uh, starting in January with an, an increased COLA, lower premium, and, and prescription drug cost uh, reductions. So I think costs is definitely on people's minds. And so the next question from the public is, what are your proposals to lower energy costs? And we will start this one with Mr. France. The key to reducing energy costs is to, at a fundamental level, not have a one-size-fits-all solution. We have seen a move towards solar and wind as the only solution to providing power and providing energy. I think we need to have a more robust power. We are not prepared right now to have that as be our only source. I think that the, we've seen a move and I'm thankful for it that the EU announced uh, within the last couple of months that both natural gas and nuclear are sources of green energy after decades of saying they were not. I think that is an opening where we can now have a diversified source of fuel and be in producing energy. I think that will help reduce the cost. The, I think the other thing related to green energy, nuclear power, is a source of the cleanest energy we can produce. The challenge with that is we have the byproduct of that, the nuclear waste, when it's resolved. We need to deal with that, and that has been something for decades that the federal government has failed at, frankly, and has left the material on site. Uh, having said all of that, I think that we, the more diversified that we can make the electrical generation field, the better it is for the people of this country. And I think that uh, looking at solutions besides solely solar and wind, and looking at how we can ensure that the discharge from the plants, using natural gas as an example, is clean, 
using technology, I think that is a better solution than using a cheap source of, of energy. When you get to solar and wind, and that source, it is a more expensive way. The only way that we are able to do that is by using tax dollars to subsidize that industry. That is not a robust way of, and long-standing way to have a sustainable uh, energy source. I think we have to have a, a broader discussion on this. I think that having multiple sources of fuel mo uh, to provide electric electricity and energy costs will help to keep those costs down. What we have right now and for you know, several decades is a one size mandate from the government that we're only going to go to 100% renewable and the only type of renewable is solar and wind. That is not the policy that will work. It will not the policy that will keep the cost of, of energy down. And I think we need to look at a more broader approach uh, to that solution. So um, let me just say, I mean, tax subsidies uh, have been the mother's milk of the oil and gas industry in this country going back to the end of World War II. I mean, so the fact that there is no um, special place for, for oil and gas or fossil fuels or coal in terms of, you know, not having the benefits of federal government supports, the oil depletion allowance. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Um, the fact is, is that um, what I see out there right now is that um, between the infrastructure bill, which, um, again, included provisions to uh, uh, extend the service life of nuclear reactors, that are active, including one down in Waterford, Connecticut, um, is, a, is, is an example of where the federal government is stepping up to try and uh, create other options of clean energy. 40% uh, of the electricity uh, in the state of Connecticut comes from Dominion, and, um, and I think that it's just it's a, a, an essential component to um, a carbon-free energy future, and, and something that uh, I brought the Secretary of Energy, uh, Janet Granholm, to the district uh, a few months ago, to, and she went down and met with the, the folks that do great work uh, down at Dominion, and we talked about the nuclear waste issue because there is an initiative to create uh, an interim storage uh, plan. Uh, again, they did an, um, a request for information around the country. They got 200 responses of communities that might be interested in an interim storage um, site, uh, and they are now rolling out the phase two uh, of that whole uh, process that's there. The other thing that the infrastructure bill did, which is so critical, is it's also putting in money to upgrade and modernize the grid. I mean, the fact of the matter is we have an old grid, even with existing uh, power sources and power uses. Uh, and as we, I think, do move into a decarbonized future where electric power for vehicles, homes, a uh, whole variety of other um, activities um, is gonna put more demands on the grid. And, and the infrastructure bill smartly um, invest uh, big uh, money in terms of making sure we are going to have a grid for the future to deal with a decarbonized uh, economy. And as I said, we, we just passed the, um, the, the measure that in terms of climate change w was very broad in terms of it's not just solar and wind. Uh, you know, there's geothermal, there's, there's all kinds of research being done on other technologies to, to generate uh, power. And, and one of the biggest is, is to, again, retrofit and, and uh, provide more um, conservation for homes in the Northeast where we have the oldest housing stock and some of the oldest building stock. That is a huge way just with, without producing a single watt of energy to reduce uh, dependence and lower costs for um, uh, all Americans. And so the next question, we're going to start with Mr. Courtney, and you mentioned electric vehicles. The public is interested in knowing what actions do you support the federal government to take on improving public transportation and making the transition to electric vehicles? So uh, one bill that, again, just recently passed with decent bipartisan support in the Senate, unfortunately became pretty partisan in the House, was the Chips and Science Act, which is, um, again, a measure that is so critical to our country's, um, but not just our economic um, security, but frankly, I think our national security. Um, you know, the, a lot of the technologies like semiconductors and chips, which were invented in the US, are now being produced overseas. And what COVID taught us was how brittle the supply chain uh, is for, the, for those components. Uh, talk to any car dealer and they will tell you about the fact that they could not get product because th there was a shortage of chips. What the Chips and Science Act did is it, it provided incentives to insource the production of these really critical um, essential elements uh, to, to a, a modern economy. 
Um, where there's actually a new facility opening up in Western Connecticut, uh, about 200 or 300,000 square feet uh, European company that's going to be uh, beginning the process of chip manufacture right here. The big one is Intel in Ohio, which uh, is a you know hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, investment in terms of chip technology. And, and again, that's where again I think between the infrastructure bill and the Chips Act, we're really going in a smarter direction, learning the, the hard lessons uh, of COVID about the importance of having a strong um, nationally controlled supply chain. And in terms of mass transit, again, the bill that we just passed actually has incentives for uh, electrifying uh, large vehicles, including buses, school buses, you know, postal trucks, uh, you know, all of these vehicles, which really don't have necessarily a wide, long radius of travel on any given day, they're perfectly situated for, for EV power, uh, you know, um, sort of models that exist right now. And, um, uh, and, and there's a company up in Enfield, Connecticut, Control Module. I was up there the other day. They're making some of the technology for the charging stations. They, the phone is ringing off the hook. And they are, it's a company that uh, added 30% uh, just this year in terms of the product they're selling. And as this new law kicks in, I mean, the sky's the limit. And places like Connecticut will benefit. I just want to take a quick moment, Mr. Fransom, just to remind you that um, Mr. Courtney has used up a little bit more time. So feel free to use more time in this question if you would like. So go for it. Uh, thank you. So the, the first on public transportation and the investment in that, uh, the challenge that you face when you're looking at that is do you have the demand uh, to make use of that and make it an efficient use of it? So when you look in an urban setting, uh, New York City is an example, you have a large population and you have a high uh, transit there. You have a commuter where you have a, a train coming every six minutes during commute time. When you look at uh, some of the places in Connecticut, which are uh, less populous, you're looking at every half an hour or an hour. And when you're talking about trying to form public transportation that is more than just a convenience for travel to the city of New York, and you want to make it a, a commuting tent like we have in our cities, uh, the challenge is do you have the critical mass of people to make it efficient? Uh, and so that's the first challenge with that. And uh, I, the other part about public transportation is just human nature. Uh, and I learned this as I look in California uh, in the late 60s, 1968, uh, Mayor Bradley uh, was running for his first term. And at that time, there was a plan to essentially cover the entire greater LA basin from the hills of Pasadena all the way down to Orange County for about $400 million was uh, the advertised price and connect everything. And he ran on a platform of, I won't make you get out of your car. And if we look back in 1968 in Southern California with the Beach Boys and Travel to the Beach and Muscle Cars, that played well with the people and they killed that plan. Now, 20 years later, he's running for re-election uh, and traffic has gotten terrible in Southern California and he's running on a platform of public transportation. Uh, the cost obviously has gone way up for the mere cost of about $4 billion. They're gonna give about 10 miles of track. And so I think that the challenge is you have to have a critical mass of not only people that have an interest, but also a demand. So in the case of Southern California, the reason that public transportation worked is you had a traffic issue that was substantial, literally stop and go along the major highways. Uh, that is why, frankly, in our region, Metro North is so successful, because that traffic into New York City uh, makes it successful. When you're looking at electric vehicles and that the entire green energy process, I spent the last half of my career in the Navy as an acquisition professional, and one of the things we learned about is life cycle costing. And that is not just the product in its use, but it's the product, what does it take to build that product, and then at the end, what is the cost of disposal? And there are environmental concerns on both the front end and the back end of that that I think need to be addressed, and they're not being addressed currently. So when you're talking about the rare earth metals that need to be harvested out of the ground, uh, is, a da is really damaging the environment there. When you look at the back end, the batteries that are in our vehicles, the solar panels and the windmill blades are not recyclable, and they're being buried in our grounds. And we've seen in the past where we've had environmental dangers that are things get buried and decades later we find out. So I think we need to resolve those issues before we move down this path. As an engineer, we look at those problems ahead of finding a solution. I think that's the, where we need to go back to is start figuring out what are you going to do when you're end of life? So you have an electric vehicle that has a number of batteries and when you start talking about the use of that vehicle, so talk about public transportation, buses and, and other things, 
it takes a long time to charge that battery. And so we have to look at, do we have the infrastructure to be able to support that? And you start looking at those issues and there is a dramatic gap between the desire to have electric vehicles and the ability to support them, both by capacity on the grid, as well as the speed with which you can fulfill and recharge those batteries to be able to use them. I think those are problems that we need to resolve before we move f too much further down this path. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with, like we had here in, in, uh, in the state of Connecticut, we had a recent bus fire because of the battery uh, blow up and we took all the buses off the road that were electric. Those are very real hazards as a, you know, when I was in the Navy, I was a damage control assistant responsible for firefighting. Uh, electrical fires are very dangerous. They take a very unique way to put them out. And I think those are some things that we need to look at, those consequences, and have a plan for those should they happen. Because once a battery lights off, an electrical system goes on fire, it is very challenging to put out and is very dangerous for the people that are there. Right, so switching gears to the next question, then we'll start with Mr. France. Uh, what are your views on the right to privacy as it relates to reproductive rights, contraception, and gay marriage? I think the right to, I think everybody has a right to their own privacy. I think we've seen laws that have gotten passed over time related to health uh, care and uh, private information within uh, the Social Security Act. We have private PII, private uh, personal information. I think that we need to make sure that people feel secure in that. Uh, the, the challenge that we face in that is when you're looking at uh, the recent Dobbs decision and we see what is happening with that. I've looked at that and related to privacy specifically is not the concern that gets raised by most people that I talk to. Uh, when you've talked to and I've listened to pro-choice individuals across the district uh, in this issue related to reproductive rights, uh, you have a challenge where they most uh, universally, the pro-choice individuals do not support late-term abortion. And they're accepting in, in the almost universally of reasonable limits on that. And so when you look at that, uh, and I look at my own, I, I believe this should be a state's issue. I don't believe this is a federal issue at all. And when you look at it from that perspective, you know, unfortunately the Supreme Court in 1973 made a different decision. They made it a federal issue. Uh, and currently with the Dobbs decision, it still continues to be. But that's not the role of the courts. They should not be making law. Uh, the legislative branch of government is supposed to be doing that. And so the, the uh, legislature and the Congress should be taking this up. The courts have ruled that the, the Mississippi law and Dobbs with 15 weeks of a reasonable limit. Um, and I think that that's something that should be debated and what that reasonable limit is. Uh, I do not support a ban on abortion, uh, unlike my, my opponent who has issued many emails out to, principally to fundraise, claiming that I support a ban on abortion. Now, the questionnaire that I submitted to a pro-life group clearly states that I do not support a, a complete ban on abortion. And clearly, the life of the mother in rape, cases of rape and incest are incidents where there should be a, available. But when you talk to people, they don't believe that day of birth abortion, which my opponent recently voted for, uh, is appropriate. And I think there should be limits that are reasonable, that most people support, and that once the, um, the child is viable, that that is a time when we should be not looking to terminate the, the pregnancy and, and looking at other alternatives to support the mom as they're dealing with these issues. Mr. Courtney? So in the wake of the Dobbs decision, I hear from a lot of people that they're very concerned about their right to privacy. Because if you read the decision, what Justice Alito basically said was that um, uh, Roe v. Wade was built on a, um, uh, you know, on a, a, uh, an opinion where there, was no, which, where there was no enumerated right in the Constitution for abortion. Well, the problem with that is that all right to privacy cases before and after Row, um, you know, involved non-enumerated rights, whether it was the right to travel, whether it was the right to have contraceptives, whether it was the right to marry uh, the person you love. Um, and, and um, you know, these, are, these were all sort of crafted around, uh, again, a, a judicial precedent in, in terms of finding a right to privacy within the overall structure of the Bill of Rights, uh, particularly the, the 14th Amendment. Um, so um, when, you, when you think about what um, the Dobbs decision did, I mean, it really sort of undermined not just the right to, to have an abortion or reproductive 
choice, but it also frankly raised a serious question about all these other privacy cases that floated. And Clarence Thomas made it pretty clear, um, you know, he, he is somebody who's of a mind to, to, to go revisit a lot of those decisions with the same logic uh, of the Dobbs decision. When I was in the state legislature uh, in 1990, we passed a bipartisan bill that codified Roe versus Wade. Um, and I say it is, uh, 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 Bipartisan because it passed actually in the House 136 to 12 and 31 to 3. And again, it, it, it's just codified Roe, which it, it built the whole premise of how dis medical decisions are made around um, the, the uh, determination of viability and, and that the life of the, and, and um, health of, of a mother after the, the period of viability was something that re was really in the, in the hands of the, of the doctor and the patient. The American Medical Association, after Dobbs uh, was handed down, described it as an egregious intrusion by the government into the medical examination room, and went on to say that it basically has put patients' health at risk. I agree with them. Uh, I don't agree with, um, you know, the, the, with Justice Alito. And um, the best way to solve the problem would be to pass the, the Women's Health Protection Act, which we voted on in the House, and it passed, and unfortunately was blocked, again, in the Senate uh, because of a, um, and that, you know, not enough votes for cloture. Um, you know, Mike, when, when you were on uh, Channel 3 with Eric Parker, he asked you whether you would vote for the 15-week um, Lindsey Graham Mississippi law as a member of Congress, and, and the answer he gave was yes. Well, when you think about what that means is that you may want all this to go back to the states, but you know, that wasn't the question you were asked. You were asked about a federal law. It would totally capsize the, the Connecticut statute, which I just described and which I voted for. That is not what the people of this state or this district want. Um, and, uh, and I think that you know, the, the real solution is to restore Roe I mean, look what happened in Kansas in terms of just, I mean, Kansas, where they, they came out in record numbers to, to uh, reassert uh, the fact that uh, people want their privacy in terms of how their medical decisions are made between them and their doctor. We should listen to the AMA. We should listen to the American College of OBGYNs, the Amer American Nurses Association, the American Nurse Practice. I mean, all of these groups have united around the fact that we, we have got to, um, as, as, as a con a, a, a legislative branch address this issue by passing the law that really is almost verbatim the same as the Connecticut statute that's still on the books today and is good law for now. Mr. Vance, would you like to respond to that? Uh, yeah, I think I find it interesting uh, that my opponent brings up uh, the statute in the state of Connecticut that was passed in 1990 because it does have the term viability. Uh, well, it's generally accepted that viability is approximately 20 weeks of gestation. And so when you look at that and you look at the law that was passed and the provisions within the Women's Health Protection Act, uh, it essentially allows uh, abortion all the way up to birth uh, at 7th, 8th, and ninth month. And when you look at the other thing it would do is it would also serve to nullify state laws across the state, across the country, on things like parental notification or parental consent that other states have done. In fact, it would even nullify our own state law because it would not just have viability, it would allow by federal med fiat uh, abortion up to birth. Uh, and you're talking third trimester where most people, and I said every pro-choice individual I've talked to universally does not support that. And that's what's codified in the federal law. This is the challenge. This is frankly the challenge and the danger that we face as free citizens in having the federal government dictate to all 50 states. I would prefer it not to be a federal issue. I have been clear on that from the beginning. I believe federalism works. When the federal government starts getting involved, and unfortunately, almost 50 years ago, the Supreme Court made a different decision. So it is a federal issue, and it's up to people's elected representatives in Congress to have a debate and decide on what, the, what is appropriate. So the next question from the public, we'll start with um, Mr. Courtney this time. Um, what is your position on immigration reform and addressing the recent surge of asylum seekers? So. Um, uh, again, in this district, uh, immigration is definitely uh, a closely watched issue, and we have a lot of um, casework that uh, my great staff down in Norwich is involved with in terms of family reunification, dealing also with different visa programs, uh, with different employer groups. And um, what I would just say is, uh, you know, I believe in comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, you know, that's been tried a number of times. Uh, this Congress, we actually tried to be a little more focused as maybe a, a different strategy that might actually get something uh, moving, and we passed the Farm Worker Modernization Act in the House with a bipartisan majority, would lower the cost for uh, uh, 
uh, H-2A visas for farmers who, again, really desperately need um, more workforce in terms of you know, milking the cows, picking the crops, um, you name it. Um, unfortunately, again, the, the Republican blockade in the Senate um, you know, even blocked consideration of a bill that was probably endorsed by three or 400 different ag groups uh, around the country. And, I, and, and when you go out and talk to farmers, which I do a lot, um, you will hear uh, workforce as one of the biggest concerns that they have in terms of trying to, again, make their farms uh, succeed. In terms of you know, the, the uptick in, in um, you know, encounters that are happening at the border in asylum uh, applications, uh, again, we, we track this and follow this. We get lots of calls in our office and, and we engage with people who, who ask these questions. Right now, it is uh, Venezuelan refugees that are flocking in the biggest numbers um, at the border. They're fleeing a, a, a dictatorship, a left-wing dictatorship, which you know, I would think you know, we would get more sympathy in terms of folks on the Republican side. But nonetheless, um, that's, that's the, the biggest um, group that's, that's coming uh, at the border there. When they claim asylum, I think it's really important because some of the, the news outlets act like, you know, that's like an automatic uh, ollie ollie in free. You know, you're, you're automatically uh, become um, legal in the U.S. Uh, if you look at the um, rate of asylum applications that are actually granted, during the Trump administration, over four years, it was about 20 percent. 80 percent were rejected, and the people were basically sent away. Uh, in President Biden's first year in 2021, the uh, uh, success rate was 16 percent. But the problem is, is that the volume, which you mentioned in your question, has created a backlog that really has um, got to be addressed. The administration did, I think, make a good uh, decision in terms of having immigration officers adjudicate cases to try and expand and accelerate the number of cases, and that, that program seems to be showing good results right now. I personally feel that that's something that we, we should really focus on is in, in terms of expanding the capacity of asylum applications, which the U.S. is in, 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 obligated by treaty, international treaty, to, to adhere to, and, um, and, and we should have a rational system that, that deals with the overarching question of really trying to come up with systems where, again, critical parts of the country and the economy can get um, individuals to come in and help our country grow, just like it always has um, from our earliest days. And I'm Irish, my family you know, started, came over here during the potato family, we all have these stories, and, um, and, and, but it's been a success story all, at the end of the day for our country. Mr. France? As someone who grew up in Southern California and San Diego area, right in the vicinity of the border with Mexico, and for a period of time literally lived one town away in South San Diego, a San Isidro and then the border, and literally could see the wall and the hill, uh, boy, I'm very familiar with this issue. Uh, and what we see is um, a change and, uh, in policy, uh, or I should say in enforcement of existing law. The federal government's choosing not to enforce the laws as they're on the books. When you look at asylum, uh, you have the people coming here and they're conditioned, they're trained, they're taught. If you say the word asylum, you will be let there. There's no provision to detain them and they are released with a promise to appear. The problem is the vast majority of them fail to appear. And while it may be that 16 or 20 percent uh, of the people are found to be qualified and the others are not, if they don't show up, we don't have any way of knowing where they are in the country. And what we've seen is it's not just an issue, as some people have said, of just the four border states. Uh, these people are being transported around the country, uh, and they are landing in places, even in my own town, in the middle of the night, a bus full of, of people coming from the border ended up in the center of my town. And so those are things that the people are not understanding. And we don't even know all the people that are coming in because the Border Patrol estimates that there are three times the number of people that they interact with. And essentially the policies of this administration, instead of the Border Patrol uh, maintaining the integrity of our border, they're now actually being custodials of the individuals coming across the border. And as far as asylum, uh, an individual uh, seeking asylum from uh, a tragic thing in their country doesn't get to wander the world and figure out where they want to land. Once they've left that country, they're no longer in danger. And so to have the policy of the last administration where we adjudicated the asylum claims while with the, the Remain in Mexico plot plan, that then allowed us to determine whether they were truly seeking asylum or not. 
And that is, I think, the, the challenge that we face is we don't know who's in our country because, as I said, they don't show up when they have a promise to appear. And I think we need to look back at the responsibility of the federal government to protect our borders and ensure that we have a control mechanism. So if we go back in time, and Congressman Courtney just brought up the you know, Irish immigrants. I have an Irish background as well. If we look at the major immigration between 1880 and 1923 when immigration was stopped in a general form, we had effectively a wall. That wall was the ocean. And they came in principally through Castle Gardens uh, and Ellis Island. We no longer have that based on the ability to transport via air traffic or even coming across the border, southern border. So we see people flying into Mexico from around the world. Over 150 different countries of the almost 200 that are recognized have come into this country. That is effectively just an open border and they're using the asylum process as their mechanism to get inside this country. And that is not what asylum is meant to be. And as I said, when you look at the 16 or 20 percent, and then you count the number of people that don't show back up again. It's a substantial issue of, of people that are here in this country that we don't know why they're here, we don't know what they're doing, and there are potential risks to the, the population that is here. Can I just really quickly, uh, the question of attendance at asylum hearings, because we get asked this question a lot. <laughs> we, we get lots of calls into the office, and we've chased that down in terms of the uh, professional staff in Washington to determine what is the attendance rate. And the last figures that we got was it is roughly about 90% show up for their hearings. Okay, and as I said, the rejection rate is um, much higher than I think is out there. Um, in a lot of the social media. And lastly, I would just say, I, having visited the border a number of times, um, I, you know, walls are very appropriate in certain parts of the border. Um, Nogales, Arizona, which I visited, is a divided city. I mean, half of it is in Mexico and half of it is in the U.S. You have to have a wall. It's a very densely populated um, municipality, and, and, and they do a great job down there. I have a nephew who works for the Border Patrol, uh, in Arizona, and, and nobody is, is saying that, you know, we're, we've abandoned uh, walls where appropriate, where there's a population density. And in, in the last budget that we passed, we actually gave um, ICE and Border Patrol more funds and, and more technology so that they can actually monitor more remote areas where the, the, the cost of a wall really just it, when, versus the cost of technology, drones, et cetera, that can actually track the border is, is just a much more efficient and intelligent way to, to um, again, protect the border. So moving on to the next question from the public, uh, we will start with Mr. France this time. Um, the public wants to know, what do you believe are the top national security issues facing the U.S. and the top actions that the U.S. should be taking? I think the, when you look at national security and you look at the issues around the world, I think that um, the biggest issue that we have is, frankly, the triangulation between China, Russia, and Iran. And that triangulation, uh, as we uh, left Afghanistan and made the retreat there and abandoned that strategic location, made that problem worse. And so when you look at the uh, capability, frankly, when we look at our own interests here in, uh, in uh, Eastern Connecticut and the submarine industry, it's interesting that the NDAA of 2007 stated that we should have 48 submarines uh, to meet the needs. That's the sense of Congress that was categorized in that NDAA. Uh, and the challenge is we have not met that need. Uh, and I think that when we look at what we have, we haven't, at that time it was between 2020 and 2032 that we would be below that. And now it's projected, as according to a recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, out for the next two decades. I think that we look at that, it's great that we have the two submarines per year that are here, they're being constructed, but the reality is to meet the need, and when we're looking at uh, the rise of uh, the military in China, uh, and during uh, my opponent's term, we've looked, seen the uh, Navy in China surpass us. Uh, they may, as some claim, and it's probably true, not have the capabilities that we do, but sheer numbers uh, will outdo us, and we don't have the deterrent force of the submarines to be able to do that. And I think that is something that we need to look at. When you look at other decisions that have been made over the last you know, 16 years, you see a process of, uh, an example is littoral combat ship. That was a program for a battle and a, and a mission that didn't exist anymore. 
but we built it anyway, and it was not built well, and now we're decommissioning them very early in their cycle. So it was a waste of money for, uh, for that service. We also saw decisions to combine the capacity of a, a cruiser and a destroyer into one platform. They're for two very different missions. And there are a number of decisions that have been made uh, in the new hull design that has cost a lot of money. We look at the capacity of, uh, and we go back to uh, the Obama administration uh, and the sequestration. You know, we look at national security today as, as impacted by the fact that we cut the defense budget in real dollars, which had a dramatic impact on both material and personnel readiness. So as we look at national security from a military standpoint, we do not have the force today that we need in order to combat that. And we see a rise uh, both in, uh, as we see Russia invading Ukraine, you see China with making noise about going to Taiwan. And I think that the, the challenge that we face is we need to have a strength of a military, as President Reagan said, peace through strength. If you're going to have diplomacy work, you're going to have that ability to deter action, you must have a credible force that you're willing to use if required. If you don't have a credible force or you don't have leadership that gives an indication that you're willing to use that, then diplomacy will fail. And we've seen the results of that with Putin invading Ukraine as an example. Mr. Courtney? So uh, the invasion in February of this year obviously um, was uh, an event which I think has really, um, you know, driven home the point that, and I agree to, a, to in some areas with, with what Mike uh, said, but um, clearly, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a world right now where international norms, rule of law is very much um, under threat. And the, the invasion of a, of a sovereign country, democracy, uh, by Putin, I think is, is probably the most shocking uh, case that, that's, that's um, now something that we're addressing. And I, again, voted last week uh, with the majority to, to uh, supplement the Medicare, medical, the uh, military equipment for um, Ukraine, which uh, again is showing incredibly impressive uh, results. Um, you know, in the Indo-Pacific region, China's uh, uh, posture, which again uh, has been violating uh, international rule of law in terms of maritime uh, behavior, which the UN Law of the Sea Treaty uh, chastised them for, um, is something that uh, I think, you know, along with Taiwan, really showing that that's a, a part of the world that, um, again, international rule of law is under threat. There's two ways to address it. Number one is by strengthening the Navy, and as chairman of the Sea Power uh, Subcommittee, um, we plussed up again this year the size of the Navy's uh, shipbuilding budget. We did it every year under Trump uh, in terms of, uh, you know, doing that on a bipartisan basis. Uh, blocked cuts to the submarine fleet that uh, President Obama tried in 2013, reversed his uh, budget, which only wanted one submarine instead of uh, keeping the two per year cadence. Trump did the same thing in 2020. Again, working on a bipartisan basis, we reversed that cut and kept the two per year cadence. The, the, the attack submarine fleet is over 50 subs today, and they actually are doing service life extensions into some of the older Los Angeles class, which is gonna keep that level um, Again, I would like to see it bigger. The, uh, the, the shipbuilding plans really call for a 66 attack subfleet um, uh, fleet. And, uh, and lastly, one thing is that if we're really gonna address these, we have to work with our allies. And, and one of the most impressive examples in the last year was the new treaty security agreement with Australia. Um, the centerpiece of which is submarine construction. I co-chair the Friends of Australia Caucus and the AUKUS Working Group, which is a bipartisan group of members in terms of implementing what I think, again, is one of the most significant ways to, to strengthen deterrence for some of this really malign behavior that we're seeing in the world today. So we're actually hitting our last question, so it could be a lightning round, and we are gonna start with Mr. Courtney. Um, what actions do you think the federal government should take in planning for and mitigating the impacts of climate change? Well, again, I think decarbonizing, um, you know, the, the, you know, way of life that we have is something that um, is long overdue. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and, but again, I think we, ha we just passed a really good balanced package that's going to make a big difference in terms of uh, moving us in that right direction. Mr. Fan? I think the challenge is to have a broader solution. We have been down this path for several decades of mandates that the only solution is, as I stated earlier, solar or wind. 
I think there are other solutions, and nuclear is one of them. Uh, but I think that we need to, because we have emphasized solar and wind exclusively, I think that the engineering field, the technical side of things, has not looked at how do we continue using fossil fuels but not have the discharge. We saw the uh, catalytic converters were created and put it on cars, which helped. If we looked at those kinds of technologies, there may be a solution there, but the problem that we have is the mandates from government that have chosen the solution. You don't choose a solution before you identify the problem and figure out what is the best way to get there. And that's where we've had. We've had government mandates, top-down dictates, and at, that has been driven by how we've invested. So we see federal dollars only going into those things. And while geothermal is another source of, of uh, non-carbon non producing energy, uh, the challenge is that, that we're still a long way away from getting to the point where that is going to be a sole source. So I think that when we're looking at climate change and we look at the issues there, we need to be a broader perspective and, and open up the aperture to additional solutions besides the one that has been dictated by the government and the federal level, and that's what I think we need to do. And using technology, using the expertise of people, catalytic converters didn't exist. Somebody created it. Somebody came up with a great idea. But because the federal government has mandated that this is what the, what the solution, the investment in research that is predominantly paid for by the federal government isn't going to these other solutions that may provide a different or an alternative or a better solution. That is, I think, what we need to do is open the aperture, look at the different solutions, and that way we can find a better solution for the future. So we have now concluded the debate portion of the program, and we will have both candidates make their closing statements. And the first one we'll go is Mr. Courtney. You have two minutes. Great. Well, thank you um, for hosting what I think was a, a very good exchange um, this evening. I would like to address one quick point when we talked about mass transit. Um, you know, there was um, my opponent talked about how you know critical mass is necessary to make it sort of work. I would just say, you know, as we sit here in Wyndham County. Uh, there's a need for mass transit here, even though it is pretty sparsely populated, because frankly, there's just a lot of people for whom owning a car or, or um, you know, uh, paying for a car's operation is out of reach. The good news is we've actually seen some really good mass transit um, start up in this uh, sort of 395 um, corridor uh, serving towns like Plainfield and Thompson, and, um, and I'm somebody who believes that rural mass transit is, is critically, um, should be really given um, lots of more help, and the infrastructure bill did so. Um, you know, I would just say, uh, my time in Washington, uh, I, there's two kinds of people. There's some people who, for every day, um, it's how many tweets have I um, gotten likes and shares on, uh, how much social media have I gotten, how many cable shows have I gotten on to, to sort of be, and how outrageous I can be. To that, some of those people, that's a good day. They don't really work in terms of trying to, you know, build coalitions and consensus around issues that are actually going to solve real problems in this country. And... Uh, in my time in the state legislature, uh, where um, a Connecticut Magazine poll was held and I was voted Democrat, most admired by Republicans and most conscientious, um, I've carried that same um, attributes, I think, to, to Washington. Uh, the Luger Institute, which ranks bipartisan behavior, has given me the highest rating, rating of the Connecticut delegation, House and Senate. The, committee, the uh, Vanderbilt um, University Effectiveness Index has put me in the top 10% in the last uh, survey they did. That's what I'm focused on as a member of Congress because, frankly, this district, that's what these people that I represent, have the privilege to represent, are looking for, and I'm asking them for two more years to continue to get results that make a difference in their lives. Mr. France, you have two minutes. Thank you. I think there's been a, a good contrast in the debate here on the issues that are, that are of concern to the people. Uh, I've spent my life in service, uh, first in uniform, enlisting in the Navy, uh, and joining the submarine service, volunteering for that duty, uh, earning an ROTC scholarship, serving as a junior officer on surface ships, and then finishing the last half of my career as an engineering duty officer back with the submarine community doing overhaul and repair and new construction. And over that time, I've learned a lot. And the principal thing that I learned is about leadership. And that is, I think, as I look at why did I decide to run. If I thought that uh, the district was best served uh, by the current uh, member of Congress, I wouldn't have run. But I don't, I don't think there's the leadership that's there. We see it in this, term, in this current term where we see inflation, the cost of food, the, the distress that people are feeling with public safety. And so those are the things that I think that we're taking a wrong direction. 
And, and as we look at what are the solutions, I think leadership is the key. And I agree that bipartisanship and that what I've learned in serving locally first is frankly how government is supposed to work, where the people can come in and seek redress with their elected officials and expect an answer right in front of them. And I've observed as I've gone to Hartford, and it's further as I've listened to people across the district, the disconnect between Washington and the, the district and the people that are re represented. I think the key is building those relationships. And I've done it at the local level. I've built relationships as the ranking member and the committees that I serve on with the chairs. And that, that is what has produced good legislation. I agree that that's what it happens, but that is not what we see today. You know, we look at uh, voting records. We look at uh, my opponent being a party line vote. He is perfectly aligned with Nancy Pelosi, and that is not serving the district. And that is not what we think of as a leadership and representing us in Congress. And that is, I think, why we see the, the problems that people are dealing with here today in this district. Once again, service is my hallmark. That's what I've done my whole life. And I think that the people of Eastern Connecticut deserve a leader who is going to represent them and be available to them and be responsive to their needs and serve them and not serve the party. I just want to take a moment to thank both candidates for spending time with us during this debate. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Connecticut Public and the League of Women Voters of Connecticut's debate series. Don't change the channel just yet. Connecticut Public's Frankie Graziano is standing by with their post-debate coverage. Our next debate will take place on Tuesday, October 11th, between the candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives' first congressional district. Ray Hartman will be your host, live from Manchester Community College. If you have a question you'd like to ask the candidates, head to ctpublic.org slash vote. I'm Catherine Shen. Have a great evening. inside the Fine Arts Instructional Center at Eastern Connecticut State University, where we just had a successful U.S. Second District debate from Connecticut. I'm Frankie Graziano. Thank you to Catherine Chen for moderating this spirited debate. Uh, we are going to talk uh, in a moment to representatives of the candidates who just spoke, and we're going to interview two folks. But first, I'm going to start with a state representative, a Democratic state representative in Connecticut, Pat Boyd. Pat Boyd. You represent some northeastern towns, including Brooklyn and, of course, Pomfret. I, I just want to ask you a real quick question. I want to ask you, how do you think these issues that came up, uh, like uh, abortion, inflation, that where the two candidates seem to, I guess, uh, have an opportunity to jab one another at that point? That's where it might have been maybe an inflection point. Uh, how do you think that Joe Courtney, a candidate you support, did there? Yeah, I think Joe did what he needed to do tonight. He showed his work ethic. He showed that he jumps into the policy of stuff, and he had actionable solutions going forward. He didn't just talk about the philosophy of it. He talked about what he's done uh, in multiple administrations, some Democratic, some Republican, and what he wants to do going forward. The details matter, and I think he laid them out tonight. He said he was enthusiastic about, and this is my last question for you, he sure. said he's enthusiastic about Medicare. He says he's enthusiastic about uh, dropping prescription costs and, and really dropping the cost of health care. Do you think that came across? Yeah, I think he, he acknowledged that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We're in unprecedented times, both in foreign affairs and the economy here in the United States. And, you know, there's a number of things that have happened over the last couple of years, but he laid forward what needs to happen going forward. And, again, actionable steps and what he will bring is what we heard tonight. Pat Boyd, thank you very much. A Democratic state representative in the state of Connecticut. Take care, Pat. And joining me now, Irene Haynes, a state representative, a Republican state representative, representing East Haddam and representing a, a part of Colchester and also the first elect woman of, uh, of uh, East Haddam as well. Hey, just, just really quickly, I want to ask you about performance. And when I'm asking you about performance, I want to understand if Mike France, a candidate you support, had... Um, I want to say uh, credibility on the topics of inflation and uh, really when we're talking about public transportation. I want, to, I want to see if he had credibility there and if it inspires you to think that he can do something you care about very much, which is uh, improving prospects for workers in the state of Connecticut. Absolutely. I think one of the things that um, Mike brings to the table is he really has uh, 
a great deep understanding of the issues with his uh, work that he's done in the House, actually even his local work he's done. He understands what we need in, in the way of infrastructure and also being an electrical engineer, being somebody who's been in the Navy, he, he just understands the people of this district and what they need. And so I think he definitely has um, a breadth of knowledge that we could use and he wants to come up with solutions. And he wants those solutions to be um, brought forth before we throw, start throwing federal dollars at it, which I think is so important. When asking about credibility and performance, I got to know, do you think he did enough to inspire some confidence from voters here in the last month or so before the election? Absolutely. As a Navy veteran, 20 years in the Navy, three deployments, um, has um, worked on the Appropriations Committee here in Hartford. Um, he knows where the money is. He's walked the walk. He's talked the talk. He is the guy. State Representative Haynes, thank you so much for joining Connecticut Public here on the campus of Eastern thank Connecticut you. State University. Now, uh, we just did interview some representatives for the candidates, but uh, this is by no means over. This is a post-debate analysis from Connecticut Public. I'm not going to be alone here. I'm going to be joined by Mark Pazniokas, who is the Capitol Bureau Chief for the Connecticut Mirror and our joint federal policy reporter for the Connecticut Mirror and Connecticut Public is Lisa Hagan. She's joining us as well. Guys, I got to tell you, it's been 20 years since a Republican candidate has unseated a uh, Democratic incumbent in the state of Connecticut. It happened in this district. It was Sam Gadenson. And that was by uh, Rob Simmons, excuse me, about 20 years ago. So, Mark, I'll start with you first. I got to wonder, are you seeing in this race that same opportunity for this candidate who's the challenger, Mike France? Well, the difficulty for Republicans in this district is that nobody has gotten better. Nobody has broken 40% against Joe Courtney since he won by fewer than 100 votes in 2006, which of course forever earned him the nickname of Landslide Joe. Um, but the reason Republicans tend to focus in this part of the state is because in other races, uh, midterm elections, namely uh, gubernatorial elections, uh, in 2018, the Republican nominee for governor, Bob Stefanowski, carried the second district. So this is why, uh, and the same is true for the 5th District in the west part of the state. So that's why you always see Republicans focus on can we make inroads in the 2nd and the 5th. Um, the, the, one of the other challenges is that Representative Courtney has been around since winning in 2006. Um, he has not, quite frankly, been seriously tested. Mike France probably is the more, uh, the, the most credible of, of challenges he's had. But Courtney is known for a, you know, kind of a mild personality of, of a focus on constituent services and obviously great attention paid to the submarine building industry, which is crucial in this part of Connecticut. So Lisa, I got to ask you then, are you seeing or at least hearing as you're down in DC, it's so great that we have a DC reporter with us, are you seeing that there, those inroads are being made by Mike France's campaign, or at least if it's not uh, specific to that, maybe in other districts? Well. Right. I mean, National Republicans definitely see the fifth and the second as their best options for flipping a seat. And as Mark alluded to, midterm years are especially typically historically good for the party that's out of power. But the difference between the fifth and the second is that National Republicans are spending in the fifth. We're just not seeing them in the second right now. And I think... If they started to spend there, that would be an indication of momentum kind of moving towards Republicans. Sounds like a cash in hand problem. But uh, let's talk about some issues. And it seemed like inflation was a, was a huge issue earlier on. And, and when I'm talking about inflation, I, I just talked about it with Irene Haynes. We're seeing that passion and enthusiasm uh, related to Medicare costs and, and health care costs overall when Joe Courtney's speaking. And then in inflation, we're talking about diesel fuel uh, costs and potentially getting those lawyered, uh, lowered, excuse me, diversification of energy when we're, we're talking with Mike France. What was a memorable moment uh, for each of you when we're talking about inflation? And I'll start uh, with you, Lisa. Yeah, well, the thing that Joe Courtney kind of has in his corner is that Democrats just passed the Inflation Reduction Act. And so it's very, it's not typical for, you know, a party in an election year to be able to pass something. And so Joe Courtney is able to point to this bill and say, 
They're going to try to lower prescription drug costs. But the flip side for Republicans is that they're using that same bill kind of as a wedge issue, saying that spending millions, billions, trillions of dollars adds to inflation and then also points to the high cost of, of fuel. And so they're both kind of using that in their respective ways. Mark, on inflation, uh, we're, we're, we're talking back there as this is happening. We're seeing, we're seeing that enthusiasm, but we're also hearing a lot of things about, uh, when we're talking about diesel fuel, and this has been a big touch point because it's easy, uh, it's easy for any candidate to kind of relate maybe to like, the diesel fuel driver, right? The diesel truck driver and say that costs are going up. But can you blame that on one party? Is that something that you can do is blame, I guess, the local economy on diesel fuel prices and those rising? Well, and we've certainly seen that in the race for governor. There's been an effort to blame Governor Lamont. But, you know, as, uh, you know, as we all know, that inflation has been a worldwide phenomenon. Um, as, as Congressman Courtney pointed out, um, the United States is a net exporter again of, of energy, of oil and natural gas. Um, there are uh, anomalies in the system of distribution, which is why some of <laughs> our oil goes overseas and we import other oil because of where it can get to refineries and when. And, and the two candidates, I think, had a fairly high-minded discussion of what drives the economy. There were really few sharp edges there. Um, Mike France, <coughs> excuse me, Mike France certainly took, um, uh, he showed he agrees with the basic Republican line that the massive aid we've seen during COVID was inflationary. And, but he really, um, uh, he really took a soft approach to that. We did not hear any gentlemen really invoke Biden and Trump as, as cudgels against each other. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big key here. That's, we're talking about performance, right? Uh, the three of us are sitting back there and we're enjoying ourselves trying to see where these candidates are going to shine. And you're right, they didn't take that opportunity to maybe jab each other. So I, I, I was going to talk about maybe the credibility that each candidate had, but I'll jump ahead. And uh, seeing some Facebook posts and things like that, it seemed like the tone coming in, at least on, uh, on uh, the side of Mike France, might have been a little more uh, aggressive in, in talking about uh, Ukraine and Afghanistan and comparing uh, Joe Courtney to being maybe their favorite candidate. Uh, there, there was that kind of a joke on Facebook, but I don't know if we saw that tonight. Maybe, maybe a little more muted. What do you think? Oh, I didn't hear any of that whatsoever. I thought it was a very respectful debate that did uh, go deep in detail. I think both these candidates certainly showed a command of the issues. Uh, if voters were looking for sharp differences, you know, the list was fairly short. They disagree on Medicare expansion, they disagree on abortion, and they disagree on the forgiveness of student loans. But to your point about performance, you know, people look at these things for, you know, a couple of things. It's, one is just the impression. How do these guys come across? Um, but also, let's be honest, the audiences for congressional debates tend not to be huge, particularly in a year in which um, there is not a lot of money being spent in this district to whip up interest and, and give a sense that this is in play. Um, so, you know, debates generally don't move the needle. I don't think we heard or saw anything tonight that fundamentally changes the second congressional district race. Lisa, Mark tactfully used the word detail, I think, uh, in, in, at least that's how I caught it. So uh, did the candidates maybe get too far into the weeds tonight or at least uh, into, into the details? What do you think? Definitely a little wonky as someone coming from Washington. So, yeah, I mean, they really <laughs> delved into the issues. You didn't exactly, as Mark was saying, you didn't hear them talking about Trump or Biden so much. I think Mike France at the end kind of gotten a little Pelosi jab, kind of connecting uh, him, uh, Joe Courtney, with the House Speaker, which is something that a lot of national Republicans do, but we just didn't hear that. There wasn't a lot of contentious moments, and even when they disagreed, it was a pretty civil debate. And, and, but just really quickly, I mean, I know what a COLA is because I have a paycheck. Uh, may, many, many folks may not necessarily know what a cost of living adjustment is. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, the little jab uh, from me to Joe Courtney there. Do you know what a, a cola is? Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but I mean, you know, people watching this might not be, you know, in the weeds on the public service loan forgiveness program that Joe Courtney is very big on, or some of the other stuff. And so, uh, you know, but it was it was very issue heavy. 
We have just a few minutes left, so I just want to I just want to really get into this last topic to button up this debate: abortion. That seemed to be where we got the most energy out of either candidate or at least maybe the most rancor uh, in this debate. So um, let me not get too far into that. Let me just get your impressions. I'll start with you, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing was that, you know, Joe Courtney or, or Mike France brought up the fact that Joe Courtney had said that he supported Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina's national abortion ban at uh, 15 weeks. And Mike France said that he didn't support a national abortion ban, even though that was in an interview. And so I think he's trying to kind of toe the line like a lot of other Republicans running in Connecticut are. He wants it to be what he says a state rights issue, not be a federal government issue. And that's something we hear from a lot of Republicans. And so uh, Joe Courtney kind of challenging him on that a bit. But Mike France trying to, you know, stay more towards the center on an issue that's, you know, obviously a pretty contentious one. A very contentious one. Mark, can you give me the ground floor and do this really quickly? Can you give me the ground floor uh, explanation on what's really happening with parental notification? Here it's been highly politicized, I think, maybe on both sides. Well, it, it's an easy talking point for people who want to be pro-choice and yet make a gesture to the pro-life um, segment of the population in Connecticut. And that's what we've seen in the gubernatorial race. Um, Connecticut, you know, if this, if this is going to remain a state issue, Connecticut has a counseling law which encourages minors getting abortions to consult with family and, pre and preferably a parent. Parental consent uh, is, is, is often, well, parental notification often equates to parental consent because once the child consults with the parent, it does become the parent's decision in, in most cases. And not every family is, shall we say, set up to act in the best interest of the child on all matters. We only have about 30 seconds each for this next one. This is going to pretty much be the last topic I talk about tonight. A couple big breaking news items happening today. We understand that Politico has rated the 5th district race in Connecticut. They've rated that now uh, a toss-up. And Leora Levy, as I understand it, will have a party, uh, or at least a, some kind of sponsorship venture, at Mar-a-Lago, uh, which has been in the news. So. I'll start with you, Lisa. What are your impressions of those two big breaking news items? Well, as someone who has covered Leora Levy and talked to her after her big Trump endorsement and, and, you know, and won the primary unexpectedly, she had started to kind of downplay her connection to him. So it is, uh, But it is not surprising she's doing a fundraiser given that she has a big disparity in money with Senator Blumenthal. And then the 5th District race, I mean, it is the most competitive one in the state. It flips between lean Democrat and toss-up, and so there's just tons of outside money, so we'll just have to kind of See what happens. Mark, about a minute on these two topics. Uh, regarding uh, the status in the 5th District, um, I could give a damn what an outside pundit says, whether it's a tie. The bottom line is it's a competitive race. We all know it's a competitive race. Whether you call it a likely Democratic or you call it a toss-up, it's a competitive race that's getting a lot of outside money coming in. Um, regarding Leora Levy, she really has no choice. She cannot turn down any invitations um, for fundraisers at this point. She has not been on the air with campaign ads since the night she won the primary on August 9th. She effectively, her campaign is broke. So I don't think there was much of uh, a struggle and decide whether she would accept the hospitality of <laughs> Donald Trump. Uh, and as Lisa noted, I mean, everybody knows that she is a supporter of Trump, and Trump played a huge role in her winning an upset victory in a three-way Republican primary for U.S. Senate in Connecticut. What a debate we had here tonight. Thank you so much to Catherine Chen for, for uh, doing a great job moderating tonight. Of course, the candidates, Joe Courtney and Mike France. And it doesn't stop here. You heard us talk about the 5th District. You heard us talk about the U.S. Senator race. We plan to have debates on those. And you can join us next Tuesday night at 8 o'clock from Manchester as we have the U.S. 1 race between Dr. Larry Laser and the incumbent John Larson. And then, as I understand it, next Thursday, we're going to be in the 4th District. We're going to be in Norwalk in a race between Jamie Stevenson and the incumbent Jim Himes. What a great night we had in Willimantic tonight. Thanks again to Catherine Shen and, of course, my colleagues here, Mark Pazniokas and Lisa Hagan. Good night from Willimantic, and thank you so much for watching.
Funding provided by the Connecticut Democracy Center, the Governor M. Jody Rell Center for Public Service at the University of Hartford, Travelers, and Yukon Health. Apply to Eastern Connecticut State University, New England's number one public regional university and Connecticut's only public liberal arts college. Take advantage of our new reduced out-of-state tuition. Live on a beautiful residential campus with a private college feel. Discover your passion. Take charge of your future. With dozens of majors to choose from, you'll gain hands-on learning experience in your chosen field. Find your place here. Learn more about Eastern today. Visit easternct.edu visit.